Now, tonight I want to preach on the subject of the New World Order. This is a term that a lot of people have heard, but they don't quite know what it means. New World Order. And when we talk about the New World Order, what we're talking about is a one world government, a one world religion, and a one world financial system or one world currency. Now, the reason that it's called the New World Order is because in the current world order, the way things are right now, we have a multitude of nations. We have 200 or so different separate nations that are sovereign. They have authority and autonomy over their own affairs. We have right now a whole bunch of different religions throughout the world. We have Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all these di various different religions. And then also we have all different types of currency. Even if we were to just cross over New Mexico, we wouldn't be using dollars, we'd be using pesos. Or if we were to go to Europe, we'd be using the euro. If we would be going into China or Japan, we'd be on the yuan or the yen. But there's coming a new world order where there will be a one world government, a one world religion, and a one world currency. Now the Bible tells us to prove all things. So in order for me to get up here and make this kind of a claim that the Bible predicts that there's going to be this new world order, then I should be able to show you these things in the Bible. Right. And the place where all three of these elements are found is right here in Revelation 13. So look down at your Bible and first of all in verse 7 I'm going to show you one world government in the Bible. In Revelation 13, 7, speaking of the Antichrist, it says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. That is a one world government. When you have one man who has power over all kindreds, all tongues, and all nations, that's a one world government. Look at verse number 8 for a one world religion. The Bible says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. You know, when everybody on the earth is worshiping one person, that's a one world religion. Right. That's a uniting of even the Hindus, the Buddhists, the, the Muslims, the, everybody that's on the earth, the Bible says, shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Jump down to verse 16, and I'll show you this one world monetary system. Verse 16, the Bible reads, He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six, or six hundred and sixty-six. So here we see that no one can buy or sell outside of this system that's going to be a mark that is put in your right hand or in your forehead. That's a one world monetary system. It's not just that you cross the border into Mexico and that no longer applies. Or we get on a plane and go to Europe and we're using a totally different money. No, all men, free, bond, poor, rich, everybody is going to have to use a mark in their right hand or forehead in order to buy or sell worldwide. That is different than what we have today. That is a new world order. That is a one world financial system. So all three of these elements are right here in Scripture. Yet there are people out there who, when you talk about the new world order or things of this nature, they say, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist or you're, you know, you're some kind of a nut, you're paranoid. But wait a minute. Can you really be a Bible-believing Christian and just ignore Revelation 13 when it predicts that these exact things are going to come to pass? Right. Now, in order to understand the New World Order, we have to understand the subject of Babylon in the Bible. Now, go back to Genesis chapter 11. Because it's often helpful when we're studying any subject in the Bible to go back to the first time something is mentioned. Go back to the beginning. And it's so interesting how the book of Genesis is the origin of so many biblical doctrines. So many biblical doctrines, we can go all the way back to Genesis and sort of see that subject introduced and then follow it throughout the Bible. And so Genesis chapter 11 is our introduction to Babylon because it tells us of a place called Babel. And that is where Babylon derives its name. It's actually the same place. Babel later becomes Babylon. Genesis chapter number 11. But before we read chapter 11, look at chapter 10, verse 32. The Bible reads, These are the families of the sons of Noah, 
after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So the Bible is telling us here that after the flood, nations were divided. They were divided into nations. See, it's God's will that there be separate nations on this earth. It is not his will that there be a one world government, that all nations unite. Now, in Revelation 13, when we saw that united nations, when we saw that united religion, that was all of the devil. The dragon was the one that put that into power. This is God's work. In Genesis 10, 32, dividing nations, okay? Now look, if you would, at chapter 11, verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, which makes perfect sense because obviously everybody who was on Noah's Ark all spoke the same language. This is only a hundred years later that the languages are confounded. So obviously they all speak the same language. So the Bible says in verse 2, it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city. So notice that statement. Let's build us a city. All right? And that city is going to later become Babylon. Okay? But it says here, Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. Now, a lot of people in today's world, because they're being sort of brainwashed into this new world order and being taught that this is a good thing, when they see this statement, Oh, the people is one. They all have one language. Most people in today's world would look at that and say, Well, that sounds great. They're all one. They're all united. You know, one language sounds great, but it's not God's will. It's not biblical. God wanted them spread out over the face of the whole earth. God wanted them divided after the flood. And so it says here in verse number uh, six, and the Lord said, behold, the people is one and they all have one language and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they've imagined to do. Go to let us go down in there, confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So why do we have separate nations? Why do we have all these different languages in the world? It's because God divided mankind into nations and uh, caused us to speak various languages. Now, when you look at the languages of the world today, a lot of them group together. For example, if we think of Spanish, French, Romanian, Italian, we would look at those as the Romance languages or Latin-based languages. Why? Because all they are is just forms of Latin that have changed over time. They all came from one ancestor language, Latin, right? And then if we looked at languages like Swedish, Norwegian, Danish, German, Dutch, Icelandic, and English, those are Germanic language because they all kind of go back to the, the same root language and then they kind of spread out and changed over time. If we were to go to India, where they have hundreds of languages and they even have 22 major languages that are spoken by lots of people that are recognized by the government as official languages of India, 22 languages. But you can see how they actually divide into two categories because the northern Indian languages are all related and then the southern Indian languages are all related, but they're extremely different from one another. So, obviously, when God divided their languages, he divided them into some very different languages from one another. And then over time, it got even more divided as time went on. But think about how they're working on the tower, and just from one moment to the next, they weren't able to understand each other. So here they are, they're friends, they're getting along, they're working together, they're doing something. And then all of a sudden, you know, one of them wants to reach over and, and get a hammer from his buddy or whatever, and he, you know, he's like, Ni hoi shao yung yu ma? And the guy, whoa, what are you, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> What's going on? And they just couldn't understand each other because you, you, know, you can't learn a new language that fast. Anybody who's learned a foreign language after you're already an adult knows that it takes years. It takes literally hundreds of hours of study, even thousands. It takes a lot of work to learn a language. So therefore, they could not 
live together anymore. They had to split up and it forced them to scatter abroad. They wanted to be united in opposition to God, but he scattered them. He divided them in the earth. Now let's fast forward to Daniel, the book of Daniel. That's Babel. Now let's fast forward to the city of Babylon later on in history. And we're going to go to Daniel chapter 2. Let me just kind of bring you up to speed in the story here. This is the story where King Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of Babylon, he has had a dream. And he has forgotten what the dream is. But the, the dream really bothered him. It really upset him. It's given him a lot of anxiety. So he wants to know what this dream means. But the problem is, he can't even remember what the dream was, let alone what it means. So he brings in all the astrologers and sorcerers and soothsayers and the psychic 1-900 number, you know, celebrity psychic reader and whatever. And he brings them all in and he asks them to interpret the dream for him. And they say, okay, tell us the dream. We'll give you the interpretation. And he says, well, the thing is gone from me. I forgot. And, and he, they say, well, you know, how can we interpret it? And basically, he accuses them of being a fraud and says, well, if you supposedly have all these magical powers and all these psychic abilities, you should be able to tell me what the dream was and the uh, interpretation. Otherwise, you're a fraud and I'm going to have you all put to death because you've been just ripping me off. You know, my, look at my phone bill, you know, all the money I spent on it. <laughs> anyway, so finally, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they pray unto the Lord. And he actually gives them the dream and the interpretation. He reveals it unto them. So Daniel goes before the king and he's going to tell him what his dream was. Okay? Look at verse 31 of chapter 2. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou saw till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon the feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. Now watch this key verse in verse 38. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So this great image, or what we would call a statue, in the Bible it's called a graven image or a molten image. This great image has a head of gold, arms and breast of silver, and then the, the, the thighs of brass, and then the legs of uh, iron down below. This great image, first of all, the golden head represents Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom, which, watch this, is a worldwide kingdom, is it not? He just said, hey, wheresoever the children of men dwell, you're ruling over them. So he has this world empire, which is the Babylonian empire, which is based in Babylon. That's where this is taking place. That's where this conversation is happening. And Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. Look what the Bible says next in verse 39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. And another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. Now, we have the luxury sitting here in 2015 to know exactly what he's talking about because we have the hindsight that's 2020 where we see, okay, of course. The golden head, that's the Babylonian Empire. That's Nebuchadnezzar. And then that kingdom that came after that was inferior, that's the Medo-Persian Empire. And if you remember, we read about that in the Bible where the Medes and the Persians take over that Babylonian Empire. We would know the story of King Darius and Daniel in the lion's den, right? Well, King Darius was the king of the Medo-Persian Empire, the one that followed Babylon, but it wasn't as strong as the Babylonian Empire. It was not a gold empire, it was a silver empire. And it's interesting they chose that part of the body with the arms 
to represent it because it's the Medo Persian, you know, Medes and Persians. So it's a two pronged deal. So then after that empire, the Medo Persian Empire, which was a world empire, then you have the Greek world empire, which would be Alexander the Great and his conquest, okay? And then following that Greek empire, what do we have next? That iron empire that crushed and break in pieces and subdued, what did we have? The Roman Empire, right? Then it talked about in the original dream how there was going to be this stone that was cut out without hands that was going to destroy all of it, that was going to break that image to pieces because he saw that image with the gold, the silver, the brass, the iron, and then that stone that was cut out without hands smashed it and filled the whole earth and became that everlasting kingdom. We know that stone, of course, to be the Lord Jesus Christ, the rock of our salvation. Jesus, uh, it was prophesied of him, the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner, that chief cornerstone that would break in pieces everything else. Now, Jesus Christ came to this earth for the first time during that Roman Empire. Do you remember when you read that Christmas story? It says that in those days, Caesar Augustus made a decree that all the world should be taxed. Uh, everybody's heard that scripture around Christmas time, Luke chapter 2, and then of course they go and the manger and everything else. So the bottom line is that Jesus Christ was that stone and he spiritually destroyed the power of Satan, the power of death, when he came to this earth, died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again. And that happened during that fourth empire that's being prophesied here in the book of Daniel. Now, if you would, flip over to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. I hope everyone follows so far. I'm trying to break this down and make it easy to understand. But there's this vision in Babylon of a great image. And notice, it's one image. But it just has these different sections We've got Babylon and that world empire, Medes and the Persians, their world empire, Greeks and their world empire, Rome and its world empire, and then we have the coming of Jesus Christ. Right? Everybody follow? Look at Daniel chapter 7 because we have a similar vision. This time it's not Nebuchadnezzar having the dream. This time it's Daniel himself having the dream. Look at Daniel chapter number 7, and we'll begin reading in verse number 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon... Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Now pay close attention to this. Four great beasts came up from the sea. Do you see that in verse three? Make a note of that. Diverse one from another. I mean, they were different from one another. Look at verse 4. The first was like a lion. So if you have a pen and you're marking in your Bible, just underline that word lion right there. The first beast was like a lion. The Bible says, and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear. So maybe underline that word bear. The first beast was a lion. The second is a bear. And it raised up itself on one side and had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Verse 6, After this I beheld and lo another like a leopard. So the third beast, if you want to underline the word leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, the beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. Does that iron sound familiar? Great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. And stamped the residue with the feet of it. It's all the same as Daniel's original vision. Instead of four sections of that image, now it's being represented by four beasts. Beasts are what? Animals. Just the old word for animals. That first beast, the lion. Why? The lion's the king of the jungle. That's like that head of gold. And then, of course, after that, we have the bear, then the leopard, and then finally we have this diverse beast. And what it means by diverse, it means that it's different 
than any beast he's ever seen. So he doesn't have a comparison like, well, that looks like a lion or that looks like a bear or a leopard. He just says, well, this was diverse from any beast I've ever seen, but it had these iron teeth breaking pieces. It's the same language as of the iron in the image. And look at the end of verse 7. It was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And this is key. And it had 10 horns. All right, everybody got this so far? Now, with that in mind, let's go to Revelation 13. And remember, Revelation 13 is the chapter where we found the new world order laid out. We found that one world government in Revelation 13. We found a one world religion in Revelation 13. We found a one world monetary system in Revelation 13. Now that we've gotten some understanding from the book of Daniel, Let's go back to Revelation 13. Let's start at the beginning of the chapter and let's get the context here. Verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Does that sound familiar? Ten horns sound familiar? Okay, keep reading. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. And his mouth was as the mouth of a lion. Now, do you not see that these are the exact four comparisons that we had in Daniel chapter 7, just in reverse order? We have the dreadful beast of the ten horns. Then we have mentioned the leopard, the bear, and the lion. Do you see the connection? You see why we were in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 now? Because these things fit together perfectly, don't they? Now, let's keep reading. It says, The dragon gave him his power and his seed and great authority. So it's the devil who is putting this beast in power. And just to help you understand, the beast here is referring to both the king and the kingdom. In the Old Testament, in Daniel, the same metaphors were used for both the king and the kingdom. He told Nebuchadnezzar, thou art that head of gold. And that head of gold also represented his kingdom. The silver portion represented the king of the Medo-Persia, but also the kingdom itself. So the beast here, we're talking about the Antichrist. It says in verse 3, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So remember, what's the sermon about? The new world order. And in order to understand that, we went back to the origin of that idea. What did they have in the Tower of Babel that upset God? They had basically a one world government, one world religion. They were all united. One world language, one world money. Everything was united. That's what they had. That idea goes back to the Tower of Babel. It's not a new idea. It goes back to the Tower of Babel. In the nation of Babylon, don't we see that same idea? Conquer the whole world. Rule over the whole world. One world kingdom. That's what we see in Babylon. Same idea. Same thing with the Medes and the Persians. Same thing with Alexander the Great. Same thing with the Roman Empire. See, there's a continuity here of this idea. It's of the devil. It goes back to the Tower of Babel. And notice, though, that the geography changes. But the spirit is the same. We have Babel. We have Babylon. But then we have the Medo-Persian Empire, no longer based in Babylon. Now the spirit of globalism, the spirit of world government, this spirit of world domination, it no longer resides in Babylon, but it resides in Shushan, you know, the head of the Persian Empire. Later it's going to reside with the Greeks. Later it's going to reside in Rome, Italy. And Rome, Italy will sort of be the headquarters for this global system. But then go to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. But we see in the end times this same beast, don't we? Same beast. And notice, the end times beast is not just the Rome beast. Because if it was just the Rome beast, there would have been no mention of the bear. No mention of the leopard. No mention of the lion. See, it's a beast that basically is a composite of all of these. 
Okay? Now look down, if you would, at Revelation chapter 17, verse 1. The Bible reads, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet coat of the beast, full of names of blasphemy, watch this, having seven heads, and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, and having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman. And of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. Watch verse 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, when he says, here is the mind which hath wisdom, what he's basically saying is, you know, here is the, th the thinking man. Somebody who's paying attention can basically have a little hint here to figure out what I'm talking about. He said, here's a hint for somebody who's smart enough to understand it. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, when I was in elementary school, I just went to a public school, and in history class, there was a chapter in our history book called Rome, the City on Seven Hills. That was just in a public school. That was just the name of the chapter on Rome because it's a known fact that Rome is a city that was built upon seven hills. Rome, city of seven hills. Now, it makes perfect sense when you think about the fact that the book of Revelation is being written at a time when who is the global power? Rome. This is written when the Roman Empire is still around. So it makes perfect sense in the book of Daniel that the emphasis will be on Babylon. But here in John's day, it's Rome. That's why he even brings out the fact that it's a city that is seated upon seven hills. Now, if you would jump down a little bit, the Bible says in verse 12, the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Now, can you imagine ten kings or ten world leaders having one mind? I mean, in the sense that they all agree. Usually there's a lot of disagreement, isn't there, when these world leaders get together? And think about these summits that they have where the most important world leaders get together and talk about things. The G10, the G20, the G5, you know, the G13, whatever. They get together and they talk about issues and they make decisions and so forth. Well, what the Bible is teaching is that one day there's going to be like a G10 summit here where these 10 leaders of the world, these 10 kings, as the Bible calls them, are going to get together and they're going to decide to basically just hand all the power over to the Antichrist. Just hand it all over to one guy. Now let's keep reading. It says in verse 14, These shall make war with the Lamb, meaning they're going to make war with Jesus. And the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with them are called and chosen and faithful. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are people and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over over the kings of the earth. Now, if you would flip over to Revelation 18, just one page to the right in your Bible, and let me break down for you what we've seen so far. First of all, we've seen that this spirit of global government, one world system, everyone united, goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel, which is why this system is known throughout the Bible as Babylon. Later, there would be a literal, physical city called Babylon, that would rule over the earth under Nebuchadnezzar. That Babylonian empire was followed by 
the Medo-Persian Empire, was followed by the Greek Empire, was followed by the Roman Empire, and each of these empires are all part of the same system. You know, it's one image that Jesus crushed to pieces spiritually the first time he came, but he will crush it physically the second time he comes. He will actually physically destroy this system, destroy the Antichrist and his kingdom when he comes the second time. Amen. But notice how the geography kept changing like we talked about earlier. So let me ask you this. If between Daniel's time and the time of our Lord Jesus Christ, the geography changed multiple times, Babylon, Shushan, Greece, Rome, Italy, wouldn't it make sense that over the last 2,000 years, it could have changed also? Yeah. Or should we just be stuck in this thing of, well, you know what? It's just, it's just the city of seven hills. It's just Rome. No, because just as it moved geographically over the years leading up to Christ's first coming, it can move geographically up to the second coming because the geography is not really the issue. It's the spirit. Right. Mm -hmm. It's the idea of this global conquest that we're talking about. It's not limited to a certain geography. Now let's ask ourselves this question. Is Rome, Italy today ruling over the world? Is that really the seat of governance in this world? Now some people would say, well yeah, you know, it's the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican City, Rome, I mean they're running everything. Now there are people out there who have this belief that, you know, the Catholic Church is running this world and they have all the power and the Jesuits and the Black Pope and this and that. But I'll be honest with you, they're wrong. It's that simple. See, the Catholic Church did used to have that kind of power. In the Middle Ages, they did have that power. But honestly, today, they don't have the same power that they once had in the Dark Ages. Now, if you were reading this scripture during the Dark Ages, and you're living in Europe, and you said, well, I'm reading about Babylon, I'm reading Revelation 17, I'm reading Revelation 18, and I say it's the Roman Catholic Church, you know what, you would have been right. Why? Because Catholic means universal. It's the same global idea. Same Tower of Babel type globalism in the universal church. That's what the word Catholic literally means. So here's the thing. If we follow the progression here, we go from Greece to Rome, but then after the fall of the Roman Empire, you have a globalist type system still out of Rome, which is the Roman Catholic Church, and they had this thing that they even called the Holy Roman Empire. Okay, And they were the one who crowned the kings of Europe for many years. They were that king of kings where they would put the crown on their head and decide who rules and who doesn't. And in fact, it was a great turning point in human history when Napoleon actually took the crown out of the Pope's hand. When the Pope came to crown him, he took it out of his hand and put it on his own head. <laughs> Basically showing him, I'm in charge, not you. So the bottom line is, that was a decline in the power of the Catholic Church, and we've continued to see a decline in their power and influence as far as global affairs go. So depending on when we're talking in human history, the geography is going to be different. If you're in Daniel's day, it's Babylon. If you're in John the Apostle's day, it's Rome. If you're living in the Dark Ages, you're going to point again to Rome and say it's the Catholic Church, for crying out loud. So the question is, where is the seat of globalist power today? Where is the center today? Where is the capital city of this idea of a world government? Of this idea of uniting the world's nations, religions, and financial systems? Well, that would be none other than in the United States of America. I mean, it doesn't really take a genius to understand that the United Nations... The United, hello, the United Nations is based where? New York City. Where is the seat of financial power? New York City. The United Nations itself, which is an embryonic world government, is based in the United Nations, which is based in New York City, which is the United States. Now, look down at your Bible in Revelation chapter 18 as we see another chapter about Babylon. But this chapter about Babylon is about the destruction of Babylon, physically, actually, literally, physically being destroyed. So we're talking now in the future. Okay, so this would be the final geographic location of that Babylon spirit. Now you say, well, Pastor Anderson, how do you know we're not talking about the literal city of Babylon? The literal city of Babylon no longer exists. It ceased to exist even before the time of Christ.
So when they talk about the city of Babylon, it's not a literal city of Babylon. That is spiritually what it's being called. Why? Because it's that same Babylon spirit. That same Tower of Babel spirit that we see in all these different geographic empires. Okay, look down at your Bible there in Revelation chapter 18, verse 10, when the Bible talks about the physical destruction of Babylon. And it says, standing far off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. Now let me ask you this. Who would have to be destroyed in order for it to be said, no man buyeth our merchandise anymore? I mean, think about all the merchandise that's made in China, Vietnam, that's made in Japan, that's made in Germany, that's made all over the world. Who is the greatest consumer of this world? What's the great consumer nation where if they stopped buying your stuff, you'd say, who's going to buy all this stuff? Who is it? The United States, hello. I mean, where does all the made in China stuff go? To Walmart, right? It's going to the United States. See, the United States is buying all the merchandise from all over the world, more than anyone else, to where if we were to look in 2015 and say, who does this verse apply to? Revelation 18, 10, and 11, where if they were destroyed, people would say, oh man, they're weeping, they're crying. And they're not crying like, oh, the loss of life. Oh, the humanity. Oh, the people dying. It says they're weeping and mourning repeatedly, it says, because nobody's buying their junk. Yeah, right. I mean, that's right. Ah, what am I going to do with all this stuff? The Dollar Tree's not there anymore. You know, there's no, there's no Dollar Tree, no Walmart, no Americans. Just buy, buy stuff and throw it away. So, therefore, you know, this fits perfectly with the United States when we look at this in Revelation 18. And just, it, honestly... Who's the runner-up here? I mean, there's one superpower in the world right now. It's the United States. The United Nations, the globalist government, is based in one place, New York City. It's run by the U.S. People say, get, uh, you know, get us out of the United Nations. I've seen the bumper sticker. It really would be get the United Nations out of us. Right. Yeah. You know, they're inside us. They're inside the United States. We finance the thing. It's, it, you know, we run the thing. Hello. Now, there's another theory out there that says, uh, you know, well, Jerusalem, they'll say the new Babylon, the new sort of capital city of this system, the new geographic location would be Jerusalem. And, and when you look at scriptures on Babylon in Revelation, they'll say that's Jerusalem. You look at Revelation 17, they'll identify that as Jerusalem. When you look at Revelation 18, they'll identify that as Jerusalem. Well, let's test that with scripture and see if that theory holds up. Okay. First of all, number one, it can't be Jerusalem because if Jerusalem were destroyed, no merchants would be saying what they said there. Oh, nobody's going to buy our stuff anymore. They'd just be like, all right, flip the boat in reverse and we're heading for the U.S. You know, of any, any shipments that were going into Jerusalem. It's not like Jerusalem is just this great consumer of all these goods, all this merchandise, where when they go under, it's like, what do we do with all this stuff? Okay, that's number one. But number two is that we already saw Babylon defined as Rome in Daniel. Okay, because they'll try to say, oh, well, Jerusalem's on seven hills, kind of. But here's the thing about that, though. Rome was clearly described in Daniel. So we're not moving the goalpost here. In Daniel, he said it's going to be these kingdoms and that when Christ came, this global kingdom would be ruling, which is the Roman Empire, the Iron Empire. And so, clearly, if it's, if it's Rome and Daniel, it's going to still be Rome in the book of Revelation from John's perspective living at that time. And if the torch is passed from Babylon to the Medes and Persians, that makes sense. Why? Both globalist empires. Uh, you, you know, going to the Greeks, the Romans, the Catholics, and then to the United States, it all makes sense. They, they all are congruous one with another. Whereas Jerusalem would not fit that bill. Jerusalem is not the capital city of any world empire. You say, well, yeah, but the Jews are controlling things and, and behind the scenes. But wait a minute, they're not doing it from Jerusalem. You see, the Jews today reside in New York more than in Jerusalem. If you look at the population of Jews in the world today, there are about 15 million Jews today, so-called Jews. About seven, uh, 7 million of them live in the U.S., and about 7 million of them live in Israel. There are just as many, or even slightly more, living in the U.S. than there are living in 
the nation of Israel today. And then just a measly one million scattered throughout the whole rest of the world combined. So you have like seven million here, seven million in Israel, and then one million everywhere else. You know, and these are approximate numbers. I'm simplifying it for the sake of the sermon. But honestly, there are just as many Jews here. And, you know, whenever you run into Jews, you notice how a lot of them have a New York accent. Why? That's the center of financial power. Jews predominantly live in Los Angeles, Hollywood, and New York, Wall Street. That's just a fact. So that's another reason why Jerusalem does not fit the bill. But here's a major reason. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah chapter 51 is a prophecy about the physical destruction of the original Babylon, literal Babylon, the Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylon of Belshazzar, the literal city being destroyed. Look what the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 51, beginning in verse number 60. So Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that should come upon Babylon, even all these words that are written against Babylon. And Jeremiah said to Sariah, When thou comest to Babylon and shalt see and shalt read all these words, then shalt thou say, O Lord, thou hast spoken against this place to cut it off, that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but that it shall be desolate forever. And it shall be, when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it, and cast it in the midst of Euphrates. And thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink, and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. So get the picture here. Sariah the scribe is sent by Jeremiah with the book of Jeremiah to read it in Babylon, to read it to the Babylonians, to warn them. And Sariah is told to read the warning and to tell them of the evil that God's going to bring upon them. Then as soon as he's done reading, he takes the book that he's reading, he ties it to a great stone and throws it in the river and they say, wait, I wanted to read that one more time. No. Nope. It goes into the, the river and he says, thus shall Babylon sink. And what did he say? It's never going to be inhabited. It's never going to be a nation again. It's never coming back. Does everybody get that? Now go to Revelation 18 with that in mind. And we'll see the, the spiritual Babylon in Revelation 18 and see if you can find the similarity here. Look at Revelation 18, verse 21. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone, sound familiar, and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. Let me ask you this. Could that really be said of Jerusalem? That Jerusalem's going to be destroyed and found no more at all. No one's going to inhabit it ever again. Absolutely not, because Jesus Christ is going to reign from Jerusalem. Yeah. So for people to say, oh, Babylon in Revelation 18, that's Jerusalem, doesn't fit. Because of the fact that Jerusalem is going to be inhabited and reigned from for a thousand years. Now, some people say, oh, that's a new Jerusalem. But remember, the new Jerusalem descends down from God after the millennium. That's Revelation 21. That's a thousand years later. Okay? So to sit there and say, oh, Jerusalem's going to be wiped out and never lived in again, you know, that would not be accurate of Jerusalem. But wait a minute. Whoever Babylon is, that's true of them. You know what I mean? So let's say, okay, United States fits the bill. That's the, the seat of global power. That's the One World, New World Order headquarters. The United States, the tip of the spear of this thing. And they're the ones who buy up all the merchandise. Then it would be that when God destroys the United States someday, that no one would ever live in it again. That's what the Bible's saying here. But it would be like Babylon in that regard. Here's another reason. Go to Luke chapter 21. The other reason why Babylon cannot be the city of Jerusalem is that the city of Jerusalem is judged actually at the midpoint of the seven years. At the midpoint, at the abomination of de desolation, God brings judgment upon Jerusalem. So it wouldn't really make sense for God to bring judgment on Jerusalem at the midpoint and then at the very end of the week for him to say, oh, then, then Babylon came in remembrance before God to give under the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath if the cup of the fierceness of the wrath had already been given halfway through the week. See what I'm saying? Well, if you don't see, look down at the Bible and, and see. Luke chapter 21 lays it out here, beginning in verse 20. 
This is the famous passage that we know as the Olivet Discourse. Usually we read it from Matthew 24. Just because we've all read Matthew a million times, because we, you know, I'm going to read the New Testament. We start in Matthew, and then, you know, a lot of people, that's as far as they get. So Matthew is the book that's the most familiar to the most people. But the same thing is found in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, with just subtle differences where we can compare the three and get a full picture. But those of you who know Matthew 24 well, this will make perfect sense to you. Look down at your Bible in verse 20. When you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst thereof depart out of it, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereunto. Now, if you know Matthew 24 real well, the words that you're thinking in your mind are, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor ever shall be, right? Because these words are found in Matthew 24 at that point in the story, aren't they? Hey, then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. He says... Next here, and this is a key verse, verse 22. For these be the days of vengeance when all things which are written may be fulfilled. Now that wouldn't really make a lot of sense if the major judgment on Jerusalem is not coming for another three and a half years. Wouldn't really make sense to say, well, this is, these are the days of vengeance when all things are being fulfilled. Now let's keep reading. It says, But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. He's talking about upon the Jewish people, because he says upon this people, there's going to be God's wrath on them. And by the way, the Jewish people are not under the blessing of the Lord. Why? Because the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, that we also have suffered like things of our own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus, get this, the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. The wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. And here it says there shall be great wrath on this people, meaning the Jewish people. Wrath upon them. Talking about the physical Jews according to the flesh, Israel after the flesh, not spiritual Israel, those who are in Christ. But the Bible says here, Wrath upon this people, verse 24, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. We have that in Revelation 11. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. So let me ask you this. Is Jerusalem getting what's coming to it? at the midpoint before the rapture or way after the rapture at the very end it's clearly at the midpoint and and guess when babylon gets what's coming to it at the very end we're talking around the time of the seventh vial being poured out totally different time so it wouldn't really make any sense for god to make a big deal about jerusalem being punished these are the days of vengeance this is when everything's being fulfilled at the midpoint if that was not the main event that is the main event for the judgment of Jerusalem. Okay, Babylon's destruction comes later. He says it as an afterthought at the very end of God pouring out his wrath. This is the very beginning of God pouring out his wrath. So, let's go back, if you would, with that in mind, to Revelation chapter number 1. Revelation chapter number 1. So again, just a quick review We've got the New World Order. We started out by defining it. What is the New World Order? Well, it's one world system. Okay, it's Babel. That's where it started. It's Babylon. It's all these world empires that led up to what we have today, a world empire, where the United States and the United Nations are attempting to bring the whole world under that subjection. And the whole world will one day be fully united under the Antichrist, when those 10 leaders, that G10 summit, you know, of 10 kings, put him in power. But who is Babylon today in 2015? Well, it's not Rome, Italy. It certainly isn't Babylon, a city that has ceased to exist. 
It's not Jerusalem. I don't see Jerusalem ruling the world. I see the United States with military bases in 153 nations. Right. You know, I, and, and so we see the seat of globalist power. And some people get really hung up on, well, but it's a city. No, no, no. Symbolically, it's the city of Babylon. Not literally the city of Babylon. Symbolic. So don't get too hung up on, well, it's got to be a city. Look, if you want to pick a city, pick New York City. But, it, you know, it, it's the United States in general that is Babylon today. And we could go through Jeremiah 50 and 51 and Revelation 18 and see other similarities and other evidence to point to the United States. But uh, it, it can't, be, can't be Jerusalem. That doesn't fit the narrative in Daniel. It can't be uh, Jerusalem because they're judged at the midpoint. It can't be Jerusalem because they don't buy all the merchandise. It can't be Jerusalem because uh, Babylon's going to cease to exist. Well, Jerusalem can't cease to exist because that's where Jesus is going to reign from. That's where the 12 disciples are going to be reigning from and, and judging the 12 tribes of Israel during the millennial reign of Christ, a thousand years before the new Jerusalem comes down. Yeah, but Jews run everything. Yeah, but they're not running it from Jerusalem. They're running it from the United States. They're running it from New York. They're running it. They, they've infiltrated the financial institutions, the government, etc., etc. So, what's the moral of all of this? Well... The Bible said that when the Antichrist comes, when this new world order is in place, that he will make war on the saints, didn't it? Now, a lot of people have this mistaken idea that the saints are going to be gone. Well, no, the saints will be here. It's not a pre-trib rapture. It's a post-tribulation rapture. And so they say, oh, we're going to be gone. No, no, no. The Antichrist is going to make war with the saints. And it's not saying he's making war with, you know, somebody that the Catholics made a painting of with a halo over their head or something and said, oh, you know, saint so-and-so. No, no, no. The Bible teaches that all of us are saints. Amen. If you're saved, you're a saint. We're sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ once for all. He said, all the saints are those who call upon the name of the Lord everywhere for salvation. And if you look up the word saint throughout the New Testament, that's very clear. Amen. So who is the Antichrist making war with? Believers. Right. Who is he making war with? The saved. And it says that he will overcome them in the sense that, you know, we're not going to be able to fight back and win. But then, of course, when Jesus returns, okay, and when he actually does battle with the Antichrist and his armies, then the Lamb shall overcome them. So, you know, we can't overcome the devil, but Jesus can. All right? right. And so we win in the end because we're on his side. But look, if you would, at Revelation chapter number one. You say, why does any of this matter? Why are you teaching us about the new world order? You know, why do you want to talk about a one world government? Why do I even care about politics or anything that's going on in the world? Well, because the Bible says that we should not sleep as do others. But we should watch and be sober. And the Bible often uses not knowing what is going to happen in the end times as being asleep. Right. It uses that term. And then those who are awake are the people who understand Scripture and they know what's coming. Mm -hmm. Now, what does the Bible say in Revelation 1 verse 3? Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. It's a blessing for us to hear the words of Revelation and to understand them and to comprehend them, to understand Revelation 13, to understand Revelation 17, 18, all the other chapters is a blessing. And God says, the time is at hand. Mm -hmm. And we today see the technology in place for purchasing things with your right hand or forehead. You know, you can easily picture going to the grocery store, checking out. It's very easy to imagine. I mean, 200 years ago, they might have wondered, how are we going to do a one world currency? Today, it's just, duh, piece of cake. Easy. I mean, it's around the corner. Mm -hmm. Really, you know, it could start happening right away and it wouldn't really be that big of a shock. Now, we don't know. It, it could happen beyond our lifetime. Maybe it's going to be a lot. I mean, people in the 70s and 80s thought it's happening. You know, we don't really know when it is. We don't know the time. We don't know the day or the hour. There are those who set dates. And whenever someone sets a date, I'll just mark that date off on the calendar and say, well, I know it's not on that day. Right. <laughs> because it says, at such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Right. So whenever I see somebody say, it's on this day, I know for sure, it's, I've calculated it from the Bible, then I just tell myself, then that's one day that he won't come. Because <laughs> otherwise that guy would be like, I told you. And it's like, it's a coincidence, you know? Everybody's predicting a different date. Somebody's going to be right. So we don't know when it's going to be. We have no clue. 
okay? But when we look at the signs of the times, it's very likely that it could be in our lifetime. And we would do well to study and understand these things because of the fact that going into this, you don't want to just be in the dark because then you're going to be confused, you're going to be confounded, you're going to be perplexed. People are going to uh, be just freaking out because they don't know what's happening and, and, and easily deceived because they don't know what the truth is. Whereas those of us who study the Bible real well and we know the scriptures, we know what Jesus taught, we know what Revelation teaches, as we see these things happen, we're going to understand what's happening. I love what uh, Pastor Jimenez preached on last night, for those that weren't here, because he talked about the fact that biblically, the tribulation is going to be a time when many people will be saved because God's people always do the most soul winning when they're being persecuted the most. And he brought up that story back in Exodus about the children of Israel multiplying in the land of Egypt. And the verse says, the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And in the book of Acts, when they were persecuted, they did more soul winning. And I was thinking about his sermon as he preached that. And I was thinking to myself, you know what? If you're a soul winning Christian and you start seeing these things happen and you know this is not a drill. You know, when you get to the point where things are so clearly happening that we know it's the end, you're going to be thinking the end is really close. And, you know, you're probably going to make it a great priority to just serve the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart and all your soul. Amen. And you're going to say to yourself, wow, we only have a little time left. Let's win as many people to Christ as we can. I mean, this thing, this thing is nigh at hand. This is at the door. Right. And, you know, people talk about they're going to go hide out somewhere in a cave somewhere. You know, what's the point? Think about this. Right. And I know I'm kind of stealing your sermon, Brother Jimenez, but I just want to expound on your sermon because it was, it was a great point. You know, think about it. What's the point if you know you're in the tribulation? You know, you see World War III and then you see the temple being built and you see this guy being declared God and you see the nations united and the religions of the world united. And you see all that happening. What's the point of going and honkering down somewhere, right? Just so that you can just survive, just be alive and make it to the rapture and you can just be alive and made. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Yeah. If you die, you just get to rise sooner. So what? Like, what's the difference? Is, I mean, you're so close to the end anyway. If it's God's will that you perish, then you perish. If it's God's will that you survive, you survive. And I believe that many people will survive. And the Bible says, pray, you know, that you will. But the bottom line is, though, if you only have a little time left, wouldn't you want to just earn some more rewards, earn some crowns, win some souls? So it's like, where's the hideout? Where's the underground bunker? Where's the food supply? You know, where's the emergency equipment? No, no, no. Where's the Bible? Where's the soul winning? You know, where's my voice to make known the mystery of the gospel? Amen. I mean, that's what we ought to be thinking about. It's kind of a weird attitude going into the tribulation of how can we honker down and hide and avoid everything. No, no, no. How can we go out with a bang spiritually? Amen. You know, I, I've, I've said before, you know, I either, you know, I'm either going to be one of the first ones killed or I'm making it all the way to the end. You know, because if God's going to protect me, he's going to protect me. But I'm not going to go hide somewhere. I'd rather go soul winning. If you only got a little time left anyway. I mean, we got whole eternity to be in comfort with Christ. Let's let's go out with the you know with a bang. Mm -hmm. You know, so I love that sermon. It's such a great point because often we talk about the facts of Bible prophecy, but it's good to get a little bit of the you know the philosophy behind it of how should we even approach the subject or how do we even go into those times. You know, I remember a long time ago, w long before Pastor Jimenez was even a pastor. You know, and, and he was newer to this subject. This is a long, because he and I have known each other since he was a teenager. And this subject was real new to him. And when he first learned about how it was, uh, you know, post-tribulation, pre-wrath, rapture, long, long time ago, I remember him saying, you know, man, how do we do, what do we do? You know, how do we handle it? He said, I'm just going to slap a 93 rock sticker on my car and just drive to Phoenix and, and see what you're doing. You know, because I mean? he just said, you know, that was going to be like his cover, you know. I'm sure he's embarrassed about that, but, you know, that's going to be his cover. Like, yeah, then they're not going to think I'm a Christian if I got the 93 rock sticker. You know, that was a great joke. 
But the bottom line is, you know, he's grown in the Lord, you know, over the past, you know, I don't know, 10 years or whatever since he said, 15 years since he said that. And, you know, it's not about slapping the 93 rock sticker and heading for the hills. Now, you know, he's getting up and preaching a sermon saying, hey, I'm not hiding anywhere. I'm ready to preach the gospel and get people saved. Amen. That's what it's all about. And so why do we need to know these things? Why do we need to understand these things? Well, first of all, you know, we need to understand that the United States is not always just this good guy that never does anything wrong. Right. Because we're going into a period where the United States is no longer going to be based on the Constitution, it's going to go into this global system, which is not a good system. Right. We need to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. And we need to be on our guard about that. And, and just understand that, wait a minute, this isn't your grandfather's United States. Right? right? And then, of course, we need to be just spiritually in the know and prepared for these things. Thank God for the book of Revelation to guide us through these times. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this uh, church, Lord, and the, and the opportunity to get together here at Word of Truth Baptist Church and, and have this time of preaching and fellowship and be edified. And Lord, I pray that everyone would go away from this uh, meeting, Lord, having heard from Pastor Berzins and Pastor Jimenez and myself, that they would go away more knowledgeable, more equipped, just understanding the subject and ready to study more in the Bible and ready to do great exploits during these last days, Lord. And Lord, help us to get the practice now. Help us not to start soul winning, you know, when, when everything begins to go down. Help us to start sharpening up the sword now and getting warmed up now, Lord, so that we can be used of you in a marvelous way during this glorious time if we're privileged enough to be alive when it happens. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.